Oh, what a mess. This is Neil Schneider from Meant to Be Seen. Welcome back to my messy basement. This is the plan for today. First, going to talk about AMD's 480 RX GPU. This was a big announcement earlier this week. Going to talk about the graphics card and its ramifications for virtual reality. Next, we have an interview with Kevin Williams. Kevin is the chairman of the DNA Association. He has been working in the out-of-home entertainment market forever. Anyway, he's a really interesting guy, really interesting interview. Looking forward to sharing it with you. Finally, we've got our interview with Dennis Reichel. Dennis is one of the core developers behind Vario Perception. Why is he in on the show for a second time? Well, we've got a very good excuse because we're releasing the next edition of Vero Perception, the next alpha, I should say, very shortly. I think everyone is going to be very happy with this. So let's get started by talking about the AMD 480 RX graphics card. Now, but before I do, before I do, I just want to share a really quick reminder of, you know, the barrier of virtual reality on PC, and that barrier is processing power. In both cases, in, in the case of the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, both companies are recommending that gamers that are, want to use VR have an AMD 290 series or an NVIDIA GTX 970 series graphics card or better. Um, in, in the case of the Oculus Rift, at least, it's important that you have enough USB 3.0 ports and, of course, uh, in all cases, a fast enough CPU. So if you are going to get into the virtual reality game on PC, you need to have a pretty powerful computer to get in there, okay? Now, based on what we did back in December uh, on Meant to be Seen is we wanted to get an idea of what the sales potential was, at least for the year 2016. And I managed to get my hands on some early graphics card sales data from John Petty Research, who, by the way, is absolute tops in when it comes to graphics chips and graphics sales analysis and the whole kit and caboodle. So, but nonetheless, we were very lucky to get some early sales data. And based on what we knew of how graphics cards sold, we estimated that there would be about 7 million qual qualified graphics cards for virtual reality um, by the end of 2016. Now, some computers have two graphics cards, some have one, and then you've got to figure that not all computers are born equal, that maybe the CPU isn't quite right or doesn't have enough USB ports. So, uh, you know, based on an internal calculation, we estimated that there would be about 3 million qualified PCs by the end of 2016 for virtual reality. That doesn't mean that all of them would have a VR device attached to them. That just means that they would be qualified for, for virtual reality. Could be more, could be less, but this is the ballpark we came up with, with the data we had available to us. Now, based on this data, I used an attach rate of about 10%, give or take. So we estimated about 300,000 to 500,000 um, PC virtual reality devices would be sold. At, well, it's a staggered launch within 12 months of launch. So, you know, give or take within 2016, 300,000 to 500,000 units sold. We don't, we don't know what the actual numbers are. They could be, they could be significantly better. Maybe they're not, not quite as good, but it doesn't matter. The point is, these were the startup numbers that we had. Now, this is all dependent on Moore's law. Okay, so the computer manufacturers and the graphics card makers can't just overnight say, you know what, we're gonna triple the processing power of this graphics card, or we're gonna double the processing power of this graphics card, and we're gonna charge next to nothing for it. It doesn't work that way. Everything is very much bound by Moore's law. And Moore's law is that the amount of circuitry on a, on a wafer, be it a CPU wafer or a GPU wafer, the, the law is that it effectively doubles every two years. Now, it, it's not a direct, direct relationship to performance, but there is a relationship to performance when you start increasing that density over time on a CPU, GPU wafer. Now, what does this mean? Well, in three to five years, okay, based on, based on my calculations, there will be about 15 to 20 million qualified PCs in the market. Okay, so with enough time, as this top level graphics cards become more and more affordable, you're looking at 15 to 20 million qualified PCs ready and willing for virtual reality. But to make that possible, a very important factor there is that the head-mounted display makers don't 
dramatically increase the resolution or dramatically increase the field of view because when you do that you also increase the the processing requirements to make these virtual reality devices work so you go too far and suddenly you've reset it from you know hundreds of thousands and millions let me rephrase you reset it from millions of qualified pcs to hundreds of thousands of qualified pcs almost overnight Okay, so there really is a very st strong connection between available processing power and how many computers are actually qualified to buy a virtual reality device. Now, if we can all be even more patient, say seven to ten years, the top tier graphics card of, of today becomes the embedded chip of tomorrow. And there's about 300 million embedded graphics chips sold each year. Okay, so that's hundreds of millions of PCs that could very well be virtual reality compatible in the not too distant future. So this is really exciting stuff. But again, that catch is the HMD makers and the, you know, basically the display makers need to hold back on those resolution requirements or again, it resets back to the beginning of the cycle. Now, I don't have any insider information. Everything I'm sharing here is subject to change, and this is just a personal opinion, okay? It's just a personal opinion, and maybe two weeks from now I'll have a completely different opinion as more information becomes available. This is as I see things today, all right? NVIDIA is very much pursuing the top dog game. If we look at the, the GTX 1080 and the 1070, they are you know, blasting as much throughput as they can through these graphics cards. They're, you know, they're relatively affordable. In fact, they're probably charging a little less for them than they justifiably could because they are really high performing graphics cards based on what I've read. And again, the way they're being marketed is really targeted to the existing hardcore gaming market. Okay, so it's, you know, they're, they're obviously delivering value. And that value is targeted to the, the existing hardcore gaming community. Now, what AMD did was earlier this week, they announced the 480 RX graphics card. And the details are still very sketchy. Okay, there really isn't a lot of information out there about this gra th these graphics cards. My understanding is they deliver over five teraflops of, of throughput performance. They, have, they feature DisplayPort 1.3 and DisplayPort 1.4, including HDR, which is unique to this graphics card. They come in either 4 gigabyte or 8 gigabyte uh, memory configurations. The 4 gigabyte is, is the more, obviously the more inexpensive one. And the price point, though, is really what makes this graphics card stand out. $199 US per unit the, you know, for the four gigabyte version. So obviously a very affordable card. Um, and what it delivers is you know, VR compliance that you know, for high-end gaming on a virtual reality device, these cards will work for you. So here's the big question. Why isn't AMD going toe-to-toe -to -toe with NVIDIA? Why aren't they putting out a, like a super high-end product that is you know, blasting out as many pixels as, human, as humanly possible? Well, we have to remember that this GPU is very much positioned as a virtual reality card. At least that's what I've seen, that's what I've read. Now, as the technology exists today, so as the displays exist today, the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, they're pretty much locked down, okay? The resolution is locked down, the field of view is locked down, the native virtual reality content being developed is, is being coded with a, a performance expectation. Okay, so, so everything is in line to stay within a, a certain limit, both at a hardware level and at a software level. So provided that this, this AMD you know, 480RX graphics card is delivering everything that's needed to, meet, you know, to make virtual reality at a high level work based on these criteria, then they really don't have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with NVIDIA to deliver the absolute fastest product you know, at, a, at a premium price. So for, for, from AMD's point of view, this is a really good thing because it help, you know, if successful, it will definitely help grow and secure AMD's market share, at least for virtual reality device users. And in my opinion, I think it will likely translate to more virtual reality HMD sales than we would have faced had it been a more expensive uh, product line. But there is a catch. 
Okay, there, you know, there, there is a catch to all this. We don't know how this graphics card performs on traditional games. All right, I, I don't have any information on that. And my personal consideration with things like that, this is virial perception. So virial perception, we take existing games and we make it so that you can play them in virtual reality. But these existing games were not coded for virtual reality. They don't have certain optimizations. They're not using, let's say, the DirectX 12 API because they're based on DirectX 11 and DirectX 9. So we don't know how they're going to perform with, with this, this graphics card because you know, we really do need all the processing power that, that is available to us. So we don't know if we're going to actually end, need a higher end part, like maybe you know, a higher end GPU from AMD or NVIDIA, or if this will completely meet our needs. And we're only, to, only going to know that as more data is available to us. Another consideration is that the AMD 480 RX, it can be put in a crossfire uh, scenario. So what I've read is it actually competes with the, if I read correctly, it competes with the 1080 when you have more than one of these devices, plus it's very inexpensive. It's a couple hundred dollars less than what it would cost to buy a 1080 equivalent. But the catch is that with Vero Perception and Vorp, and I don't know about Vorpex and the others, it's probably the same for them as well, is that it's not SLI or Crossfire compatible. So it's, if, if Vero Perception is important, it's you know, you need to have a high performing single die GPU. So we're going to have to wait and see. I, I feel hopeful that this is going to work out really well for everyone. I just don't have enough information to work with right now. So let's keep an eye on that. But all in all, this was a really sharp move uh, by AMD. I think it's going to be good for the virtual reality, uh, virtual reality industry on the whole. It's really exciting stuff and a big congratulations to AMD for getting this off the ground. This is Neil Schneider from, of course, my own messy basement that's getting messier every day. To my immediate left is none other than Kevin Williams, who's the founding chair, and I want to read this because I want to make sure I get it right, DNA for short, but it's, DNA stands for Digital Out of Home Network Association. Welcome to the program, Kevin. Thank, Thank you, you for having us, Neil. It's a real pleasure. But the, the, the pleasure is ours. Now, you've got, before we talk about the market and all kinds of fun things happening in, in the public exhibition market. Let's talk a little bit about your career. I mean, you've been at this for a really long time. Could you tell us some of, about some of your highlights? Oh, well, you know, it's nice to be, you, you've got to understand I'm a consultant in the uh, out of home entertainment uh, uh, sector. We, we treat virtual reality as just another string to the immersive entertainment bow the same way that we're developing products uh, with clients on augmented reality, uh, as well as simulation. VR is just another, another tool in our arsenal. But uh, from my point of view, uh, I, I'm consult now for KWP, uh, which is an association that specializes in this sector, sorry, uh, a company that specializes in this sector. But uh, I come from a background, uh, consumer games, arcade games, a little bit of military simulation. Uh, as many of you know, I'm an ex Walt Disney Imagineer, worked on Disney Quest, as well as some of the other projects that uh, were linked to their immersive interests. Uh, I've also worked for Atari when it was acquired by Infograms. Uh, and I had the pleasure of also uh, leading uh, the amusement side of uh, Angel Studios that then became Rockstar. So a little bit of, I've worked on all sides of the table, as I like to say, uh, but now uh, I just consult and do a bit of writing. So clearly there's a lot of consistency there working in this public, I call it public exhibition. I hope I'm using the right words. Um, Exhibition's it, got problems, Neil, because there is the convention, exhibition and events industry. That's why it is designated as out of home entertainment or amusement or public space, or in our case, DOE, digital out of home entertainment. Okay, so I'll stick with out of home then what's the appeal? I mean, you've been working in this a long time. Does it have a personal appeal to you? Like what, you know, why'd you get into this? Yeah, my, my father, a very smart man, made it clear to me that rather than just finding a job that pays the bills, that I should try and find a vocation, something that gets me up in the morning. Uh, and those wise words led me to dabbling in the arcade industry, then the early microcomputer games industry, then the arcade industry, simulation, then attractions, 
then back to development. So, yes, you could say that immersive entertainment's always driven me. Uh, I think I can blame, uh, you know, funny, I was uh, having a drink with Nolan Bushnell and his son a couple of uh, days ago, and I sort of prodded him in the chest and pointed out that if it wasn't for Luna Lander, we wouldn't be sitting here having this drink. So, you know, you can trace it back to that lovely vector graphics, thrust lever, uh, arcade game that really got me into this mix, pulling you into the immersion of a digital or synthesized environment. Well, if we look at the last three to four years, and time is flying, there's been clearly a, a disproportionate, I hope I'm using the right word there too, interest in consumer virtual reality or consumer immersive technology. But are we, you know, are we starting to see a resurgence in, in you know, out of home experience? Even though there's been consistency there, are we seeing an even more of a resurgence in out of home virtual reality experiences? Well, the outer home entertainment sector had been growing uh, quite largely after, uh, let's see, it's best to say that after products like uh, Superman and Star Tours, you know, where attractions started to use digital content, uh, and where the arcade industry started to embrace new types of digital technology, we saw a, a resurgence in uh, outer home entertainment. Virtual reality came along at the same time. Uh, it's what I like to call phase four of uh, the interest in trying to popularize this technology. And uh, they commingle. Sadly, it's difficult for the media to talk about two stories. And the media has always had problems talking about our industry, the outer home entertainment industry, A, because they don't quite understand it. And B, their bills are paid for by the consumer industry. A lot of the consumer media service live off of the money that they get from the console companies and the software game companies. And they're not really going to talk about an industry that doesn't uh, feed them. Um, we for the book that we uh, wrote back in 2012, uh, The Immersive Frontier, we interviewed Palmer. Uh, this was around uh, 2011, 2012. We'd said to him, wow, you know, Sony had been putting a lot of money into uh, immersive display screen technology, head mounted displays, as we call it. You know, wow, he was doing stuff, uh, getting into this. How did he see? But at that point, it was clear that the uh, the VR guys, you know, not just Palmer, but other people just didn't see outer home entertainment as anything important. You know, the arcade industry was dead uh, and we were a bit of a niche in the outer home entertainment sector. So they, they just didn't want to uh, want to consider that. And, you know, you've seen that now, uh, by the way, that only some manufacturers of HMD supports the uh, resurgence of uh, out of home entertainment where others, you know, do not. Uh, have an involvement in that sector. But, you know, please remember, more people uh, are getting to see VR through public space entertainment, roller coasters, theme park attractions, and with a topic that's not always covered, the promotional, the marketing promotional side, you know, the Coca-Cola, the Red Bull, the Adidas, the Mercedes, the, uh, oh, the, uh, the Qantas Airline, uh, pop-up shopping mall demonstrations that use a virtual reality headset. Those have, you know, since 2012, a lot of companies have been doing that. You know, one of the biggest attractions or exhibits up until quite recently this year had been the uh, Game of Thrones traveling exhibit with their Ascend the Wall uh, attraction. Again, using DK ones, a little out of date, but it had seen thousands, hundreds of thousands of people go through that particular exhibit, but sadly with zero publicity. And, but you know, something that just came out of this is it's not just about the out of home entertainment. It's, it looks like we're getting a new class of out of home entertainment. I mean, you're speaking to the marketing benefits and so on. So it's not just a resurgence. We're seeing an expansion as well, if I'm hearing correctly. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you know, picking a project uh, out of uh, out of the hat. We look at what our friends at Sony Pictures are going to be doing with The Void uh, in July, the opening of their Ghostbusters experience uh, using uh, the, the Vive's unique uh, arena-based or arena-scale theme park system, virtual entertainment system. That's a brand new way of marketing and promoting a product. We can also look in China with the work that uh, Walt Disney's marketing promotion team have been doing with HTC, where at uh, certain cinemas in China, 
you can go and walk around Mowgli's world uh, using uh, HTC Vive. That is a unique level of promotion. And the marketing and promotion industry love that kind of ability to immerse a uh, audience in their product. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg, to use a corny phrase. Now, I, I want to talk a little more about this. But before we do, you, you've actually tried something new recently. You launched a brand new conference. Uh, which just recently passed, uh, the VR Arcade Conference, if I, if I remember correctly. Can you tell us about it? Oh, yes. Well, we were very lucky to be uh, approached by the organizers of the, the concept, uh, Virtual, let, let me get their name right, uh, Virtual Reality World Amusements or Arcades. Sorry, sorry, Jeremy, if I'm uh, botching your, your name up. The, the whole point of this was that the particular company in question was branching into the out-of-home entertainment market. They had and had very uh, expansive ideas on how to develop a virtual reality entertainment facility. And one of the things that they noticed was that there was no talking shop. There was no conference dedicated to this particular sector. And so they approached us. Uh, we were very excited. We've been desperately trying to get the uh, the sector to be recognized. You know, uh, I've had the pleasure of presenting at your conference. Uh, I presented at other conferences, you know, waving the flag, beating the drum for outer home entertainment. Uh, and so we supported this. I was able to give the keynote uh, at this particular conference that was held, interestingly enough, at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Very interesting location, especially as downstairs from the conference was one of Ivor Sutherland's sort of Damocles virtual reality headsets from the 1960s. So full circle. We were lucky enough to have uh, quite a few very prominent developers uh, of uh, what I hope to be uh, the next generation of outer home entertainment, virtual reality systems, such as zero latency, via uh, ver Zoom uh, uh, turned up. We had a really good smattering of uh, the, the leading great companies who actually took the time to sit uh, on the desk and uh, share their uh, views with uh, the gathered audience. And it was interesting also to see some of the peripherals that will be used in the uh, out-of-home entertainment sector for VR. It's now you know, become understood that building a $1,000, $2,000 peripheral to go on top of the price of the, uh, was it, uh, seven to 800 bucks for your uh, head-mounted display and the one to 2,000 bucks for your PC is not really, at this point in time, a viable business uh, approach. So a lot of companies now skewed their uh, uh, appraisal of how to enter the market by developing high-end technology for the prosumer and for the commercial application. And then once that's got a penetration in our sector, in the outer home, and it's got lots of marketing and word of mouth, then it can be scaled down for a consumer launch in maybe four or five years when now more people are willing to believe that that's when the real consumer VR revolution is going to gain momentum, be it from the daydream camp or be it from the console camp or from the PC camp. Well, first, I want to congratulate you. Because it's, you. it's never easy to launch a brand new event, especially for you know, an up-and-coming market such as this. And it sounds like it went really well. So Got congratulations on that. Got a lot of feedback. That. Got a lot of feedback. <laughs> well, that's really good stuff. Um, so I guess the next question is you got these companies together at, at, at this event, which is really positive. We're also seeing some quick developments here locally. I mean, I'm, in, I'm Canadian, so local to Toronto, we're seeing some developments. We're seeing some developments in the US uh, by Starbreeze Studios. Let, let's talk about what's been cooking. So what, what are the big highlights from your point of view? Well, the big breaking news is uh, Control V, uh, right in your back garden, if you don't mind the, uh, the grouping of Canada into uh, one neighborhood. The, the whole ar uh, argument about VR arcades have been proven quite categorically as something that people want, uh, but who was going to be the first uh, company to open a facility that was viable and had all of the, the boxes ticked, as it were. And it looks like these, uh, these guys uh, started, uh, oh, just about uh, eight or nine months ago and have now just gone through their soft opening and have opened their facility. Uh, very interesting, uh, located outside uh, of a university campus. 
16 unique enclosures running the HTC Vive on a extremely powerful PC rig. They've created their own interface and they've achieved licensing agreements with a number of software publishers so that they can run and monetize uh, the whole operation, paying 20 Canadian bucks for an hour and being able to select different types of games, including one of uh, the Valve uh, demonstration titles. So from my point of view, all of the stuff that uh, was covered in the end of my keynote about what was needed from a uh, VR arcade for it to be successful, these guys have uh, hit out of the park, and it's a really big congratulations to the team there. Speaking as a Canadian, okay, I can tell you that the $20 for the hour is, is affordable, but if you're an American, it's even more affordable because as much as this hurts, the American dollar is 30 cents more in value, so you should come over the border and enjoy some, some, some great VR at a bargain. Um, but it, well, uh, th there are plans for that particular franchise or brand to do some traveling. So uh, in the short term, jump in a car, jump in a plane and cross the border if you're in America or wait a, wait a couple of months. Now, what about Starbreeze Studios? They, they actually just a few months ago, they, they made big announcements pertaining to out of home uh, arcades and experiences. Maybe you could share a little bit on that. Well, we had, you know, at your uh, Immerse event in Spain last year, we had a fantastic time, uh, and it was uh, great for ourselves, uh, myself in particular, to uh, sit down and talk with the guys at Starbreeze. They had their demonstration of uh, their Walking Dead virtual reality experience in the wheelchair. Fantastic game. And you knew that this type of attraction was an attraction rather than a consumer product. And so we talked about that, and, you know, the guys were coy. It was early days, and they said, watch this space. Well, this space came. IMAX, uh, another very strong Canadian company, uh, leaders in the uh, large format cinema sector, both content providers as well as cinema operators, uh, have announced that they will be jumping into a partnership with Steve, uh, Starbreeze to come up with a series of virtual reality entertainment centers. They've been very coy at this uh, point in time, as you would expect, to say exactly how these arcades will work. The only thing that we know is that they will utilize a special commercial version of the Star VR uh, wide field of view head mounted display. And that's really interesting. It's got a lot of tongues uh, wagging in our sector about what this means because IMAX is a very big player. And recently we had CinemaCon, the cinema distribution industry's large event where films are announced and the uh, cinema industry works on new technology, 4D theatres, and all of that are very popular. And uh, a company, uh, Simuline, uh, who are also owned by uh, CJ, had one of their virtual reality motion seat systems there, promoting the possibility uh, of uh, seeing this kind of system in the cinema sector. And this seems to be the next shooter to hit the floor. And uh, where the void, I think, a couple of years ago, galvanized people to actually listen and talk about virtual reality out of home entertainment application, this IMAX announcement, I think, really has uh, kicked a lot of people in the lunch department to get off their get off their duffs and actually have a business plan in place about commercial out of home entertainment. Well, let's, you know, as long as you brought the void up, tell us about the void. I mean, that's, that's still a, a fairly recent development, very popular one as well. Well, we were very lucky to uh, be invited to one of the early tests of uh, uh, the, the void. For those that don't know, a Utah based company, uh, proposing to develop a number of facilities that use a unique arena scale VR system. Not only are individuals moving around a virtual reality environment with backpacks on and head mounted displays and weapons and special in, uh, interface units, they're also able to interact with uh, the physical uh, environment through a very high quality tracking system. So where you see a wall in the virtual environment, there is a wall in front of you. And also within a very small space, they are able to use directed walking uh, algorithms to con, to trick 
the uh, user's mind into believing that they're walking down a long passage when really they're walking around a circle or that they're going up or down using physical uh, effects. So the company announced uh, when we went to the test last year that they were going to be uh, opening a facility, but they also coyly hinted at uh, some investment from China that was going to see a number of facilities opened in China, and also that they had been sitting down with some major film companies towards uh, developing unique versions of the void uh, for application directly into uh, unique facilities, unique attractions, theme parks. You know, they, they said the, uh, the gambits were wide. And uh, what we heard a couple of weeks ago was the first of those announcements. And so our friends at Sony Pictures uh, announced that they would be developing a Ghostbusters experience, which would be a, a full attraction that would be housed at Madame Two Swords in uh, New York, Times Square. And surprise, surprise, in this VR experience, there will be uh, the Void. Uh, the Void are creating a special system, game, experience where people can enter the Ghostbusters universe, wielding their own backpack uh, and proton stream emitter and have a great time blasting ghosts. We are hoping to see the uh, facility do its soft opening in July. Um, watch this space. We're all very excited. And we know that this is only the beginning of a number of announcements in this vein. Uh, there is also our friends at Zero Latency who are now ramping up their operation and proposing to drop in a number of their versions of uh, arena. I, the reason I call it arena rather than room scale or warehouse scale is because I'm harking back to the theme park uh, aspirations of the technology. But uh, along with our friends at Zero Latency, we also have uh, uh, our friends in Seattle uh, with uh, VR Cade part of VR Studios, and they've just signed a major de uh, deal with uh, our friends at Simuline. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a universe beginning to uh, formulate, to, uh, to create itself. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic sector. And of course, I get to wave the flag of saying it's unachievable at home. The technology that the Void is using is the type of head mount that they're having specially built. It's using curved OLEDs, special uh, lenses and optics. Uh, it's more healthy. <laughs> oh, and a lot of tracking. Uh, and funny enough, there's a, a company, uh, we just come from a military <coughs> simulation show a couple of days ago. Um, and a lot of the technology that we see in the military simulation sector usually percolates its way into the uh, outer home entertainment sector. We like to say beating swords into plowshares, you know. Uh, so something like Star Tours, the very popular motion uh, theater ride from Disney, started its life off as a jumbo jet simulator. Uh, so and and it, we're seeing that same kind of room-based, arena-based tracking systems that are used by the military and law enforcement for uh, weapons training using uh, head-mounted displays and digital systems. That type of technology is the same type of technology that we're now seeing being deployed in the entertainment. So let's talk a little bit about that consumer space, and, and we'll, but not just so much about the consumer space, but what impact or what influence the out-of-home entertainment industry can have for you know, building the consumer market? Is there a relationship between the two? Well, Kenneth the Void described it uh, very eloquently when we uh, had the first meeting. He, he sort of painted this picture of people going to the uh, out-of-home entertainment facility and then wanting to enjoy the experience they had there or a portion of it and being able to take it home. So there would be the possibility of a consumer version of the void that would have a pared down or a component out of the bigger experience. We've seen this kind of approach tried many times in the out-of-home and the amusement industry's history. Uh, many of your uh, viewers may be familiar with the Neo Geo, uh, a very critically acclaimed and popular console, very powerful, advanced for its time. But 
they were hoping to offshoot some of the high expense of this uh, near arcade quality console by having a renting model where you played in the arcade, you saved where, uh, where you last got off in the game, you then went to the arcade operator, hired, rented this console, took it home, plugged your memory card in and carried on playing. It's that kind of idea of being able to transfer or so cross over the, from consumer, from home, to out of home that's driving a lot of people. And uh, one of the uh, speakers at uh, our uh, conference, Silicon Nexus, is a company that's working on that kind of meta universe where people can play with under, uh, individuals that are taking part in a uh, arena-based VR experience. Maybe you use your uh, PlayStation VR system to control one of the gun turrets in a virtual environment while people are uh, progressing through the bigger attraction that's at a theme park. It's this kind of crossover that uh, I think you'll see a lot more of being talked about and hopefully in the next couple of months actually being achieved. Now, let's, one more point I'd like to talk about is that the nature of consumer VR right now is filled with all kinds of meetups and conferences all over the world. It's, it's like too many to count, which in a way is a really good thing because it helps promote virtual reality to consumers and, and so on. From the point of a, an expert when it comes to out-of-home entertainment, for the betterment of VR, for the betterment of the consumers that use these virtual reality devices, do you have any recommendations for content makers that are showing their stuff to the general public as to how they could and should be showing their stuff so it's, it's A, effective for consumers, but B, safe and hygiene, hygienic that, you know, that we we're putting on a good impression? Oh, it's, it's essential. Uh, the, the old stories from the third phase of VR when uh, the first of the arcade machines and the early virtual reality systems, there's all those horror stories about pink eye being transferred uh, from a uh, dirty head-mounted display. We're, we're very keen. The one thing about dealing with the public is that safety, hygiene, and operation have to be at the forefront of your thinking. This isn't consumer. This is out-of-home public. You have to be aware of the worst member of the audience and the best member of the audience and treat them equally as safely as possible. And uh, we've written a number of uh, reports uh, detailing with our clients how the best ways to address public usage, uh, the issues to bear in mind, how to redress, uh, if mitigate uh, sim sickness. So I'll, I'll touch upon the, the easy uh, catch-alls that you need to be aware of. And number one, if I can't, if you don't take anything away from this uh, conversation uh, and you're thinking of operating uh, a virtual reality system in a public space, uh, and you're gonna have a lot of people through your system, remember, baby wipes, are for babies. Do not put them anywhere near the headset. I've come across too many clients that think just because they're baby wipes, they must be hygienic and fantastic. If it's good enough for babies, bums, it must be great for people's heads. And that's the point. These are made, uh, these, you know, there's a nice big sign on the back of most baby wipes that says not for use near eyes. Remember that. What you really want are the non-alcoholic um, uh, wipes, preferably the, uh, uh, the medical versions. They're easy to purchase off the internet. Uh, and one of the rules that we're trying to encourage people to do to try and save their lenses, especially on the consumer systems, because remember, these consumer systems have not been made for mass usage, and it's quite easy to use certain caustic liquids that will eat into those lenses. So always try and go for Quick, wet wipes, lots of dry wipes. So best to have a microfiber cloth with you when you're doing that type of thing. Sweat, makeup, and worse. You know, we've been de dealing with this problem for a long time in the outer home entertainment uh, sector since the popularity of 3D glasses and 3D, 4D films. And trying to get chocolate or worse off of uh, 3D glasses um, focuses a lot of the minds in our sector. Uh, and there is a, a, an approach, and if people need to know the details of how to uh, operate these type of systems, then we're just willing to help uh, explain them to them. The other thing, of course, is the cable. Uh, I know Palmer's called it the cable monkey or the cable slave, I think was the, the term he used. That's not one we're going to use here. What we're going to just say is, 
be aware of the trip hazard. And it's a, a real issue that we're, we're concerned about at the moment, that um, people are sort of not really, uh, you know, monitoring the individual's progression through the, uh, the virtual environment. We've got a whole load of very hilarious, but very frightening from my point of view, videos of people falling over, tripping over, hitting their heads, blowing up light bulbs, putting uh, their hands through screens in virtual reality. It's very important that the attendant in a public space sector is both well-trained, well-educated, and focused on the job. Okay, very good. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. All right, this is Neil Schneider in my messy basement. We'll be back with more right after this. To my immediate left is Dennis Reichel, one of the core developers behind Vario Perception. Of course, Dennis was on our inaugural program when we first revealed Vario Perception 4.0 Alpha. Okay, we're just about ready to release another release. So, Dennis, what's the latest? What's the latest? I did get my HTC Vive device here, and I could immediately immediately start to include Open VR support. That means Steam VR support to Vario Perception, including much much benefits that will come with that. Okay, so why don't we talk a little bit about the HTC Vive? I mean, this is, I think this is your first modern VR headset since the DK2. So you must, I, I, I gather you're pretty thrilled with this, yes? <laughs> I'm pretty thrilled with this, of course, yeah. Now we also had a, a dev kit too, and I also have a OSVR a hacker development kit. But that's, that's the newest generation uh, of, of HMDs, and um, yeah, I'm really thrilled with it, yeah. Okay, so everyone, of course, when we released Vero Perception, we had OSVR support. We had Oculus Rift CV1 support, and uh, of course, everyone's been waiting with bated breath for HTC Vive support. So, why is HTC Vive support, you know, a is so different and b so so special? Like, what makes it unique compared to the other solutions? Yeah, it's it's room scale and the whole Steam VR uh, surroundings, the whole uh, way you you uh, live in 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 cyberspace in Steam VR. With, with room scale and with the chaperone fans around you uh, moving around and this gives gives us much much more options eventually for we will talk about the heads up display and also about uh, adjusting the games right using this chaperone fans so why don't we why don't we talk a little bit about the room scale I know it's a work in progress okay where, where are mm -hmm. we at yeah. with that have, have, have you have we had a lot of progress with the, with room scale we know that it works that it will eventually work, but we have to first adjust the games and that we uh, very exactly so so uh, this this the positional tracking can eventually come after we have done all the uh, adjustments on the game separation and on on yeah fingers crossed it might even be working when this video is released we don't know <laughs> you never know. <laughs> So, but the other thing which you, you touched on, I think is a big deal, is the heads-up display. When we did yes. the first version of Vario 4.0, you couldn't adjust the heads-up. We had to like manually shrink the whole scene to get, you know, so you could see it. So what's, what's the latest update on the heads-up display? Oh, um, I was able to, to split the, the two-dimension data from the heads-up display uh, from this three-dimension data dimensional data from uh, from the game actually so we now have a, a secondary render target where the heads up display is drawn on so i can use this uh, second texture or render target inside steam vr uh, to fully customize this this heads up display as you want you can draw it as a wall now or you can focus it uh, on your on your HMD or even on your controllers. That means eventually, when we have our HTC controller support, you will, you'll be able to use your left hand and look. Oh, here's my uh, uh, my heads up display or anything. You can even customize color, alpha, uh, separately, the size, anything. You can do anything with it. So we were so worried i mean really we thought the heads up display was going to work before like out of the box compared to like direct x9 what we did and for a time 
a significant amount of time, we were worried that, you know, we were going to be stuck with this full size heads up display that a lot of people couldn't see. So I yeah. take it that's completely solved now? This is completely solved, at least for Fallout 4. And then, and we're going to be able to, and I mean, I know you're talking about the HTC Vive, but this technique, we could translate it to OSDR yes, and Oculus Rift, all that stuff. Oculus, so, Oculus er also has over layers in its SDK, so uh, this will not be much other, or uh, much different than in SteamVR, area. Yeah. All right, good stuff. Now, let's talk a little bit about Chaperone. One of the big issues with virtual reality is if, you know, when people are using room scale with virial perception in their games, we don't want them tripping on wires and crashing into walls and so on. Uh, and the HTC Vive, I understand, of course, it has a feature called Chaperone, where you know if you get too close to things, it will it will take advantage of the HMD's onboard camera and you know give you outlines and warn you if you're getting too close for safety. Do we mm -hmm. lose any of those safety features with virial perception? Is it is it maintained? No, none of this. Uh, you can't you can't even uh, lose them in SteamVR. The chaperone fence is always drawn when you get close to these fans, and yes, we don't lose any of this. Uh, we just get more benefits out of it by having having the options to fully uh, using positional tracking to, to adjust the game uh, using this uh, chaperone fence eventually. So, so if anyone had concerns that Vero was any less safe than any other software being run on HTC Vive, they, I, I take it they have no cause for concern? No, no, absolutely not. Okay, no. perfect. And now, one of the challenges with um, you know, with a game like Fallout 4 and other games that you know we're playing to support with virial perception, is that the 3D settings were never really intended to be in stereoscopic 3D, and mm -hmm. we have to yes. we have to compensate for this and you know kind of calculate for interpupillary distance or the distance between our eyes and make sure that the 3D looks right. What what kind of creative yes. ideas are we are we toying with to 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 make this work? Uh as I talked about the chaperone fans, this is the it, it is basically a, a grid drawn a grid uh, a wall grid and a, a a grid on the ground, and this grid we know exactly what its size is, and so we can use this grid go in let's say in Fallout 4 indoors somewhere in a room, uh, and 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 we can scale say, okay, this room is about this and about that, and moving left to the right, we can uh, perfectly adjust the game game or the world scale inside the game for, for room scale and for uh, uh, separation, field of view, and all, all those settings. So this is, like, this is really exciting stuff. I, I know we've been talking about this a long time, and, what, and one of yeah. the challenges with virtual reality is it's not just about you know, determining call it units, like game units, of how much space is in a game. It's about mm -hmm. having a reference. You see, unless yeah. you have a reference to go by, exactly. it's very yeah. difficult, if not impossible, to get the perfect, perfect scale. So we exactly, have an opportunity yeah. here that, mm -hmm. you know, through virial perception, if I'm hearing correctly, is, is, is we can get perfect scale, you know, as, as in how the game world relates to how our body moves and hopefully the way we visually see in 3D as well. Is that is that correct? Yes. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely correct. Yeah. That, that's perfect. You know, there's a lot more surprises. Let's not reveal all the surprises just yet, but I, I think there's a lot more we're going to be able to achieve with, with uh, the HTC Vive and the hand controllers. And, you know, really, we're finding that the sky is a limit as to what we can effectively do with virial perception, at least in many ways. Well, anyway, congrats, Dennis. Thanks for your continued hard work with this. Um, hopefully by the time this video is out, we'll have an updated alpha, and if not, shortly after. But things are progressing really far, really fast. So thanks for joining us, Dennis. Proud to be there. Okay. This is Neil Schneider from the Messy Basement, back with more right after this. Well, that's all for today. Do you have an opinion to share? Is there something you'd like to see here in my Messy Basement? Maybe you'd like to visit virtually? By all means, send us an email at neilsmessybasement at mtbs3d.com. I will talk to you again next week.